Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are kicking off a brand new year, and as such, we have started a brand new sermon series called First Things First. And last week, we looked at family. The week before that, we looked at finances. And so next week, we'll be looking at worship and just wanted to start the year off on the right foot. And uh, today, I want to start off with a little short uh, history lesson about something pretty terrible going on in R Romania with their orphans. It's a real medical condition that their orphans suffer from. Uh, in Romania and in many Eastern European countries, there are so many orphans that are institutionalized that there isn't enough food or medical supplies or staff to even take care of all of them. So the babies, if they're past the toddler stage, they're kept in diapers and they're placed in cribs just to keep them in one place because there's no other way to take care of them. They are lifted out of bed to be fed. They have their diapers changed you know, a few times a day. But other than that, there's no real physical contact from another person. There's no cuddling, there's no holding the things that babies need, and they end up, some, in a semi-catatonic state. Some even die from lack of human contact. And the condition is called failure to thrive syndrome. It seems that even though a child could be well-nourished and maybe even intellectually stimulated, without human touch, that can stunt a child's growth can stunt their emotional, physical growth. A and it could be uh, something that the child feels as an effect for years to come, their whole life. In fact, according to a 2010 article uh, in Scientific American, orphaned children who experience touch depravity in life have altered levels of oxytocin and vaspressin. Those are two hormones that are very important for social bonding. Even three years after being placed with a family, the effects are still noticed. Growth and survival touch is essential for human development. And today in the church, we have to understand that there is also a failure to thrive syndrome, and it can happen in our spiritual lives. It can be avoided and it can be cured, but Prevention doesn't happen by itself. The key to avoiding this spiritual disease is fellowship. But fellowship is much more than what we think it is. We can see uh, what we're talking about in today's passage. It's the prescription against failure to thrive syndrome in the church. And you'll find it in Acts 2.41. It says those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. Now, fellowship there, that's the word koinonia. And basically, you take this passage as the definition of koinonia, of church, right? In the church today, though, I believe that when we hear the word fellowship, we take it for granted and we put it into one of a few boxes. We say, oh, well, fellowship is a potluck dinner or a fellowship is an ice cream social. But here in verse 42 of Acts, the word fellowship doesn't mean the things that we typically think. It says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And fellowship is the word koinos, and that's where we get koinonia. It means to share. It means to be a companion. It means somebody who is participating in togetherness, participating in communion. Maybe we can answer the question of what fellowship is if we know what it might look like in our lives and maybe what we might experience as a result of it. What should we experience in the church if there is true fellowship? Verse 43 tells us, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Now, when you hear that verse, what do you picture in your mind? Like, what do you see? What are the images that you conjure? And, and when you see those things, don't you wish that those kind of things were still taking place in the church? 
well, there's no reason why they shouldn't take place, we can still experience those same things in fellowship. The truth is, we can experience signs and wonders and awe-inspiring things in our church today if we devote ourselves to true fellowship. I read about a few studies this week. One said that people with stronger social relationships had a 50% increased likelihood of survival than those with weaker social relationships. And listen to this. Those findings indicate that the influence of social relationships on the risk of death are comparable with well-established risk factors for mortality such as smoking, alcohol consumption, and other things like obesity. What does that mean in layman's terms, right? Like, break it down for me. It means people who have bad health habits, drinking, smoking, obesity, but who have strong friendships, live longer than those who have excellent health habits, but very little friends. In other words, it's better to eat Twinkies with friends than to eat broccoli alone. Listen to this one. A Harvard study says if you belong to no social group at all this year, you belong to no social group, and you decide to join one social group this year, joining that new group cuts your chance of dying in half. In half? What? And the Journal of American Medical Association said that people who have the flu or the cold, they are four times more likely to get better quicker and to experience milder symptoms, what, than those with little friends. Let's read the entire passage together. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, I'm sure that you've heard that there are relationships in life, right? And there are friendships, and they're different, okay? There are people that we know, relationships, and then there's people that we know know, right? We're closer with, those are our friendships. And perhaps we would define uh, a relationship as something that's more transactional, right? I know them, but they're in my life because there is some sort of give and take. I know my mailman, I know my hairdresser, I know my accountant, I know uh, the guys in shipping and receiving, right? But those relationships are mostly monetary. They're based on some sort of goods and services. But friendships, they're still transactional. They are. It's not monetary, but there is still give and take. The give and take is emotional. Feelings of love are exchanged instead of dollars and cents. And I believe that the Bible calls us to move from where we are to a more transformational relationship with another person, to move from relationships to personal, intimate friendships. But that's scary, isn't it? I think the reason we don't have more close personal friends is because we know that friendship, how the Bible defines it, means sharing, and it means openness, and it means letting people in, and it means being vulnerable. Proverbs 18 says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. A friend, the Bible says, is someone who's closer than a brother. Jesus says, this is somebody that you would lay down your life for. How many people in your life right now could you say that about? The Bible defines friendship as going even further than how the world would define it. In the world, a friend accepts you just as you are. But the Bible says in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron. 
and one man sharpens another. Which means a Christian friend accepts you, but they refuse to allow you to stay the same. They encourage you to be better. First Thessalonians says, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. So a Christian brother, a Christian sister affirms me and they help me grow. They want me to be more like Jesus. In the world, a good friend doesn't try to change you. You know, you, you do you, I do me, whatever works for you. Proverbs 13 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. A Christian brother or sister is there to help you change. And this is where the self-doubt starts to creep in. We talk ourselves out of this and we say, well, I'm not that kind of friend. I don't have anything to offer. I mean, what could I do? I, I, I don't know how I would help somebody. I, I can barely help myself. How would I be a good friend? That's the enemy talking to you. That's the enemy holding you back. That's the world trying to keep you isolated and alone. Fear and self-doubt are what are keeping you from having a better relationship. God wants you to have close relationships. The world is keeping you from koinonia. I want you to read the, this, par I want to read this parable to you from Jesus, and it might be a parable you've heard before, but now as we read it, I want you to think of it in regard to what we've been talking about, and hopefully, maybe you'll see it with fresh eyes. Jesus says, it's like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and to each according to his ability, they went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who also had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enjoy the blessings of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping, and gnashing of teeth. That's a pretty brutal story, right? When you read that, have you ever wondered, like, what, what are the talents? What's a talent? Well, simply, it's, it's weight. It's measurement, okay? It's money. In Israel, one talent of silver is about 100 pounds, and one talent of gold is 200 pounds. So the first thing we notice is the master is generous, right? Are you ill-equipped? No. Even the servant with one talent has a lot. Silver is worth $273 per pound right now. So even the lowest servant has $27,000. Gold is worth $22,000 per pound. So I don't even want to do that math. The master is generous. So when we look around and say, I don't know, what kind of friend would I be? I can't be a friend. I can't share my faith. I can't teach. I can't serve. Just sit down and read this parable. 
Jesus says the master rewards each servant for even the slightest amount. And they use what they are given. But what does he say to the one who doesn't use what he was given? He calls them wicked and lazy. The servant who was given the least didn't believe in himself. And they were too afraid to do anything. They were worried. They were overthinking things. They were over planning. They said, I'm not ready yet. And that fear, that feeling of being ill-equipped kept them from acting. Drew Houston is the CEO of Dropbox. He says, if you have a dream, you can spend a lifetime studying, planning, and getting ready for it. What you should be doing is getting started. Now, if you don't like that one, I got one you, you all can like. Here's, here's the rock, okay? Here's, here's Dwayne Johnson. This is, the only, this is the only church where you're gonna find a quote from the rock on Sunday morning. Success isn't always about greatness. It's about consistency. Consistent hard work leads to success and greatness will come. Jesus says, you are well equipped. You have your resources. You are ready. Start. Be consistent. Get in there. You have the ability to be a great friend. You can help change someone's life. And as such, you can help change somebody's eternity. This lesson today could be the beginning of your origin story. Say, well, how did it begin for you? You know, I was sitting in church and the pastor just unlocked my superpower. What's your superpower? I don't know. We could look at the list. Romans 12 says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let's use them. If prophecy in proportion to your faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in ex exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. What do you got there? You got prophecy, service, teaching, exhorting, which is uh, encouraging, right? Being, being encouraging. Generosity, you have leadership, and mercy. Bible also lists wisdom as a gift, um, faith as a gift, helps as a gift. The Bible says you are equipped with a few of these gifts to serve the kingdom, to be a friend. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe mine haven't come in the mail yet. Ephesians 4 says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Yeah. You know who that is? That's you. <laughs> that, in Greek, that's the word all y'all. That is all y'all. You have been given a gift. You have been given a talent. Why have you been given a talent? Just keep reading the verse. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. In other words, to help others. To be a friend. To be a church. To be the body. To be the bride of Christ. Well, do I get to retire? I mean, how long am I supposed to do this work? Go back to the verse. Until we attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, until y'all are unified, until you're all mature, you keep doing this until you're all like Christ. Well, that could take a lifetime. Good news. You have a lifetime. You have a lifetime. You have been equipped and you've been given a lifetime. At the end of the day, uh, when my family is unwinding, from work and school, we typically sit down at the couch and we pick what we call a family show. And we sit down and we watch it together. But most of the time, my two boys want to talk through it. They want to ask questions. One of them likes to sing and dance and be a distraction. And we're always telling him to settle down, to focus, to be quiet. Why? Why am I telling him to do that? Because I want him to pay attention? Because I want him to watch the show? No because he is being a distraction to me. He is distracting me from watching the show. I can't listen to two things at the same time. I don't even like listening to loud music when I drive. Not anymore, it's too distracting. 
But perhaps the reason why we are not using the gifts that we are given or being a better friend with those gifts or serving the church with those gifts is because we end up listening to two voices and they're conflicting. We listen to conflicting messages. The world right now is becoming more and more an individualistic society. That means recent change like COVID is now allowing a lot of businesses to tell people, oh yeah, you can work from home. People are working from home. Social media, ironically, has made people antisocial. Online shopping means we go out less. Blogging enables you to have all sorts of stimulus conversations without ever leaving the house. There's even church on the web. Gives you everything you need spiritually and you don't even have to leave your house. Now, I recognize that to all of those things, there are several positives, right? It's very convenient. It, it keeps you in contact with things quicker and it's a blessing for people who can't get out. And with that, we have access to a wider variety of people. But my question through all of this is, do those activities give you an environment of true unity? Do they allow you to experience love? Do they allow you to experience fellowship? This past month, uh, Joanna and I celebrated our anniversary. We went to Austin, Texas, and we were at a really beautiful hotel, and the hotel was right next to this really big glass building, and it's the Apple Capitol Ridge facility. So 216,000 square foot property. They bought this during COVID. Today, there are about 30 people who work there. 30. Why? Because they're working from home. This year, Disney fired their old CEO, Bob Chapek, and they brought back their former CEO, Bob Iger. Bob Iger's been making a lot of changes, getting the company back, and this week, he sent out a letter to his executives and his officers, and the letter said, it is time to come back to work. <laughs> he said, starting March 1st, March 1st, which means they still get all of February to work from home, right? He said, March 1st, I want you to think about coming to work for four days during the week, right? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I want you to work four days in the office. And guess what? He's getting pushback. He's getting criticism. Can you imagine? Oh my goodness. The CEO of the company is asking me to work four days in the office. <gasps> unheard of. Why? Why the pushback? Because more and more we are becoming a stay-at-home world. This year, Joanna and I probably did 90% of our Christmas shopping online. Never left home. Autonomy. And it's not a recent thing. Don't say, well, it wasn't like that when I was growing up. It was. Maybe not as bad, but it was all heading there, right? Maybe you have heard the phrase, I built this with my own two hands, right? Sure. What does that mean? It means I did it alone. I did it alone, all by myself, no help from anyone. In fact, I'm a self-made man, right? I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made millionaire, self-taught. You ever heard somebody say that? I'm self-taught. Hey, you're good at the piano. How'd you, how'd you get that? I'm self-taught, no lessons. And we praise those people. We idolize those people. We buy their books. The world wants you to do it alone. Last week, I told you the divorce rate was going down. And you were like, wow, the divorce rate's going down. That's pretty good news, right? But do you know why? <laughs> it's because less people are getting married. And it's because more people are waiting longer to get married. People are now getting married into their late 30s, more so than ever before. Because we're putting school and work and career above relationships. In a society now, we are placing more emphasis on ourselves 
than relationships. But it's not working for you, is it? Of course not. Because every night you are praying for God to help you. You're asking God to help you and you're telling him what? God, I can't do this by myself. Right? You're saying, God, I can't do this by myself. I need your help. Help me, God. I've prayed that prayer. I've prayed that prayer a lot. Guess what? You are 100% right. You can't. You can't do it on your own. You need help. Here's the problem. You're listening to two voices. Too many people are speaking to you, and you're listening to the wrong voices. You cannot go through life alone. You cannot do it by yourself. Last week, when we talked about marriage and family, we mentioned that God creates marriage at the very beginning of the Bible, and he says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. What does God say before he makes a woman? He says, it's not good for you to be alone. Which stands in juxtaposition to everything else God makes in chapter one. God makes land and sea, good. God makes the moon and the sun, good. God makes fish and birds, good. God makes a man, not good. Why is it not good? Because he's alone. First few pages of the book, lesson one. You are not a self-made anything. God made you. And second, it's not good for you to be alone. Now, does that mean I have to get married? No. It just means it's not good to be alone. Why isn't it good? We could stay in the book of Genesis. All you got to do is turn one page back. Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God says you are made in his image. What does that mean? What does that mean to be made in his likeness? 2 Corinthians says the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Who is God? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God exists as a triune being. God exists together. In other words, God, in his nature, is never alone. God is not up there in heaven all by himself. He is not alone. He is in community. God lives in relationship 24-7. God lives in community 24-7. Always. He is never alone. And because we are made in his image, it is bad for your health. Like we said earlier. We showed you those studies, right? The studies have been done. It is bad for your health to be alone. We need relationships. We need fellowship. We need koinonia. This January, we are talking about putting first things first. I don't think you can get more first than the book of Genesis, okay? You can't get more first than that. Genesis means origin. It means beginning. So listen, when you are praying to God, I can't do this alone. Help me, God. First things first. You need a friend to go through life together with. You need a best friend. You need an accountability partner. You need another man or another woman to talk to, to unburden yourself to, to confess things to, because you are right. You cannot do this alone. You were not meant to do this alone. God made the church for you. God made church for you. You know, we spend an awful lot of time on our knees asking God to help us, change us, improve us, but the power to change your life, the power to improve your life is sitting next to you, is sitting in front of you, is sitting in the person behind you. You leave here hoping that God will change you, make you better, but if you stay here, stay here longer, plug in more, these people that are sitting around you they are the healing hands that you need for your hurt. These people are the mercy 
that you need. These people hold the forgiveness that you need. They have the understanding that you need. They have the knowledge that you need. They can put you on the right direction. They can bring you a word. Each one here has been equipped. Each one here has been given a gift. Each one here has a talent that can help you. And God has placed all these people around you. You pray. That's great. You read your Bible. That's awesome. You also need koinonia. You also need fellowship. And vice versa. The people around you, they need you. They need something from you. At the same time that you need a friend, you also need to be a friend. Remember the parable. The master says, I gave you the ability to change lives and you did nothing with it. I gave you the power to help your neighbor. I gave you the power to help your relatives. I gave you the power to help your city. I gave you the power to help your state. I gave you the power to assist the prisoners and the orphan and the widow. Acts 2.42 says, when the church began, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayer. Notice, they devoted themselves. Not once a week, they devoted themselves. Not just to teaching, not just to prayer, not just to the breaking of bread, but also fellowship, also friendship, also intimacy. So I'm going to take a page from the Bob Iger playbook. And I'm going to say, we need to get back to work. You need to get back in the office. You need to stop working from home. How? Well, you're going to have to one another. Huh? You have to one another. The Bible says one another. Right? All through the Bible, it says one another. You are not supposed to work from home. You are not supposed to do church online. The Bible calls us to one another. It's used a hundred times in, the, in just 94 New Testament verses. I'll give you a few. Love one another. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Live in harmony with one another. Accept one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Be patient with one another. Look to the interests of one another. Comfort one another. Stir up one another to love and good works. Pray for one another. You know, right now we are in Walden Community Church, right? It's in our name. So by definition, we cannot be a work-from-home church. We have to be a one-another church. We need to be a support. We need to be a friend. You have been given a gift. You have a talent. You are equipped. Don't wait for the church to create a ministry that serves you. Step up and you make a ministry that serves others. Who? I don't know. Moms? Dads, teens, widows, knitters, gamers, car guys, gearheads, gardeners, programmers, cleaners. We have a campus. We have empty rooms. Let's fill these rooms day and night. Day and night. We will have true fellowship when we can demonstrate genuine caring for each other and begin to meet each other's needs. Let's put the community back in Walden Church. Let's be the church where we live. Join me in prayer. Lord, in the book of Acts at Pentecost, you established your church with flaming tongues of fire upon people's heads. You gave them a new message to preach and you gave them the energy and the excitement that they needed to get out there and to change their world. That energy and that excitement, it still exists. And we still need it to change our world, to change our city, to change our community, so that more knees bow and more tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help us to stop waiting. Help us to stop anticipating. Help us to stop planning and scheming and hiding. Lord, may your church everywhere 
get out into the streets. May your church everywhere begin to grab the hands of the unbeliever. May your church everywhere begin to help the widow, the orphan, and those who are in hospitals and who are in prisons. May we get your good news out, your message of love and grace out. May we be your hands and feet in all things in every way, and may we use our talents and multiply them a hundredfold. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. I want to remind you that we have activities all week long. We have a Bible study for men on Monday mornings. We have two Bible studies on Wednesday evenings, one at 4 o'clock and one at 6 o'clock. You're invited to all of those. You don't need to be a member of our church. Please, just show up. You don't even need to sign up. Don't even, let us, don't even need to let us know that you're coming. We would love to have you. We also have youth group for all ages, including college, on Wednesday nights, and you can get more information about all of these things at waldenchurch.com or visit our social media pages or just call us or just stop by. We are open till 3 p.m. every single day. We'd love to see you, shake your hand, and meet you. And uh, my name is David Kenny, and I have an open office all the time. You can drop by anytime to meet me, talk to me about anything. I want to be the pastor where you live. And I love Walden, and I love this community. Let's build something beautiful together.